All right, let's talk about the Monday Night Football matchup against the Bucks, with DeAndre Swift ending whatever argument there was left, Jalen Carter taking a giant lead in the Defensive Rookie of the Year odds, and Sidney Brown showed more than enough to start alongside Reed Blankenship, with Sirianni supremely confident in the Rook. So let's talk about it. But first, let's run it. What's up, guys? So let's start with a big happy birthday to Eagles cornerback Eli Ricks. And if you're wondering how I knew that, it also happens to be my twin brother's birthday as well. What is that? It is your birthday period. It's a statement of fact. Yeah, well, it is factual, and as much as it pains me to leave the 3-0, at least the birds are sitting pretty at 3-0 after taking it to the Buccaneers on Monday Night Football on the road in Tampa, except it didn't exactly feel like a road game since Jimmy Kimsky provided an accurate visual representation before kickoff with vivid seats reporting approximately 60% of the crowd at Raymond James Stadium was Eagles fans. Well, in that case, we should have known it'd be a walk in the park, although not exactly the same kind of walk that Troy Aikman experienced before the game, saying, I went on a walk and Eagles fans are very well represented here in Tampa. I may or may not have received some very colorful language from them. They have such hatred for the Cowboys, even to guys who have been out of the game as long as I have. Sorry, Troy, maybe that's because we take everything personal, or at least Jalen does, with Hurts saying before the game that the statement from Bucks cornerback coach Kevin Ross in the playoff game from a couple years ago added a little extra inspiration, which quite frankly is a good thing, since the signal caller was playing in the Monday Night Football matchup with flu-like symptoms. But come on, that was never going to keep Jalen out. Remember, his mentor is pretty well known for the flu game. Unfortunately, there were some who didn't get a choice to play. In Quez Watkins due to his hamstring injury, Boston Scott dealing with a concussion, as well as Tanner McKee, Tyler Steen, Moro Ajomo, Albert O, and cornerback Mario Goodrich. Yeah, so taking a look at this list didn't take long for us to wonder what the F is going on with Mario Goodrich being inactive. Thankfully, that question was answered during warm-ups when a report came out saying James Bradbury would be starting in the slot. How do you tell somebody that you care about deeply I told you so. All right, sorry. I'm just saying I did talk about Bradbury potentially moving into the slot, especially given the matchup in Chris Godwin and Mike Evans. Although we got to look at that very early with Josh Job and Bradbury getting tested on the opening drive, where Godwin picked up a first down and looked like the Bucks might get on the board first until Mike Evans had a big drop on third and eight, which, yeah, was very uncharacteristic of Evans. Okay, which at that point, I think we were all very eager to see what Brian Johnson and the mini buy had cooked up. I mean, it wasn't hard to guess that A.J. Brown might be involved early and often after the sideline dispute against the Vikings. But whether or not that played a factor, AJ was getting the ball to start as BJ dialed up a couple passes to 11 and also trying to take advantage of the Bucks secondary who were without a starting corner. However, as was the theme for most of the night, as soon as Philly reached the red zone, the Bucks D stiffened. Gosh dang it, can, can we just move on? That's what she said. <laughs> happy now? Okay, look, I can't tell you why, so don't ask, but the Eagles decided to go for it at this point on fourth and a long one, which normally we'd be all good with, except this time it meant Brian Johnson inserting Kenny Gainwell for a designed run up the middle, going about how you'd expect turning the ball over and giving it back to the Bucks. Of course, here came the overreaction tweet saying, just fire Brian Johnson already and fire whoever decided Gainwell should take the fourth and short carry too. All right, I'm with you that I don't like the play call or the personnel, but we're a long ways from firing someone. But the turnover over on downs gave the ball back to Mayfield, who picked up a first down on a great connection to tight end Kate Otten over the middle, guarded closely by Reed Blankenship. But, as was the case most of the night, the Philly D-line generated more pressure, bringing up another punt. And despite Devin Allen being elevated from the practice squad for this game, special teams coordinator Michael Clay decided to stick with Covey as the punt returner. And man, did he ever deliver. With the best punt return of his career in 52 yards, flashing a little speed and elusiveness to make a couple guys miss. So, maybe he's good after all. I mean, Brandon Lee Gouton definitely think so, saying, after a rough start as a rookie, Britton Covey was statistically one of the NFL's very best punt returners in his final 10 games last year. He gets lots of hate despite that, acknowledged bad fumble last week, but now the 52-yard punt return set up the Eagles with good field position. All right, now I don't know if you agree with BLG or not, but the Birds did have great field position after the punt return, and much like last week, the best plan is to dial zero, where the Eagles' offensive line helped get swift runs of 14 and 13 yards before the offense worked its way into the red zone yet again after 
after getting into the red zone thanks to Swift, the play calling went with four straight passing plays. The only positive gain to Goddard, which was called back due to a penalty, and the other three being incomplete, making Sirianni settle for a 36-yard field goal from Jake Elliott. Not gonna lie, I wasn't the biggest fan of the play calling, especially early in the game, but thankfully, once again, the defense stepped up when Marlon Tuapolotu recorded a sack along with a little help from Jalen Carter, giving the ball back to Hurts in the offense, and Jalen was able to find Smitty to move the sticks early, but had nothing going after that, meaning we at least got a look at our new punter, Braden Mann, as he hit a high 38-yard punt that resulted in a fair catch at the Tampa 16. Okay, as much as I'd love to give you a grade or report on him, there's not a whole lot to go off of because that was his only punt of the game. However, the Bucks did learn you can't run on Jordan Davis, with the second-year player stuffing the middle on multiple occasions and forcing their offense to be one-dimensional. Yet it did work for them during a stretch of the game to attack the middle of the field as Baker hit Evans as well as Godwin for first downs. Before one of the plays of the game was made by rookie Sidney Brown, who was pressed into action with starting safety Justin Evans leaving with a neck injury, and somehow the rook was able to recover just in time to knock the ball out of Mike Evans' hands in what would have for sure been an easy touchdown score. It's also worth mentioning that Brown made a great play on a wide receiver screen earlier in the drive, showcasing that physicality and athleticism we've seen that screams potential. However, the 23-year-old injured his hamstring on the breakup, but fortunately, Josh Tolentino reported today that it shouldn't be too serious, so hopefully can go Sunday against Washington. So I guess the question is, did he do enough to start? Well, according to CBS's Jeff Kerr, he did, saying, it really all comes down to if Brown is healthy. If Brown is good to go for Sunday, he should start. Brown held his own in the 12 defensive snaps he played, having a crucial pass breakup on Mike Evans in the end zone that prevented a Tampa Bay touchdown. Brown also is the second team slot cornerback behind James Bradbury. At least that was the case Monday night with Mario Goodrich, a healthy scratch. The Eagles had plans to acclimate Brown into the defense, and Monday night was an indicator of that prior to the injury. Brown allowed just one completion for a yard on Monday, so he more than held his own in coverage. Yeah, he definitely held his own, and Sirianni's also seemed quite a bit to be confident in putting Brown out there. We have confidence in him in the end from practice, right? But he then also, you know, confidence from the games that he's played, um, and, and, and sometimes that confidence is built through special teams, right? I can't, how many times have you seen a guy in the NFL make his way early on in his career in special teams and then take off, you know, after, after that when he gets his, himself an opportunity? So, Obviously, practice is what gives us our, our confidence in Sydney um, and the things that he's done in practice, but then him making plays in, in preseason games and him making plays on special teams when the lights are on um, gives us a lot of confidence. And, uh, you know, we, we got, we'll have confidence in him and, you know, whoever we, you know, James and, and Mario moving forward. Okay, it's not official, but just reading between the lines of what Sirianni said there, plus, like what we saw on Monday, there's too much potential. You've got to have that guy out there. But curious to know what you guys think. All right, so back to the game. So at this point, a 33 yard field goal by the Bucks made it 3-3 when Hertz connected with Dallas Goddard on his longest catch of the season, followed by QB1 pulling a rabbit out of his hat to find Alameda Zacchaeus for a first down after number 13 had gotten behind the defense. Jalen then went right back to him a couple plays later as Fran Duffy pointed out the defense was in cover six, so Brian Johnson made the right call to flood the zone and Jalen threw a dot to Oz for the score. And just wondering if I'm alone in this, but when Jalen first released that ball, I definitely thought it was going to get picked. Obviously, very happy it wasn't to put the Eagles up 10-3. to But speaking of INTs, Baker Mayfield tried to force one into Godwin and Reed Blankenship made him pay, creating the turnover and taking to Instagram today saying, milk check, which just in case you have no clue about that reference, Reed's responding to Darius Slay's comments back in the preseason when referencing the nickname milk check. Uh, Josh Allen, he said, when they see a guy, they just say milk check. It's a different milk check over here. They say no milk check. You about, well, this here, he he good milk. You know, he don't spoil. You know what I'm talking about. (laughs) I love it. Um, it's, it's hilarious. I told him I need to get like a, a big diamond chain that had like milk check or something on it. <laughs> okay, whatever you want to call him, the ghost is good at football. And Reed is also the first undrafted free agent with two or more interceptions in his first 12 career games since Bernard Wilson in 1979. But even with the takeaway, and when it looked like the Eagles could go down and score before going into the half, Hurts threw a very ugly pick. Although it seems like it may have been Swift's fault, judging by Jalen's response in the press conference after the game. I'm not going to be that guy. Um... Like the miscommunication on the first one. Yeah, yeah, I think you summed it up. You know, mis- miscommunication, not on the same page there. All right, who knows? And of course, Hertz said it's a team sport, so he's not going to assign specific blame to anyone. Luckily, it wasn't costly thanks to back-to-back game-wrecking plays by Jalen Carter. Despite being doubled, JC and Fletch sacked Baker Mayfield, causing a fumble, but the Bucks recovered, only to have a dump-off pass to running back Rashad White wind up in another fumble. Because this baby rhino in number 98 is violent and doesn't look anything like a rookie, with a 22-year-old accounting for five pressures, half a sack, one quarterback hit, and two 
forced fumbles, all while playing less than 50% of the snaps, leaving multiple players in awe, including fellow teammate Darius Slay, saying, that's a grown man out there doing some crazy stuff. And former Eagle Chris Long was also amazed by the Rook's instincts on the field, as well as four-time All-Pro safety Tyron Matthews saying, Jalen Carter has Chris Jones' ability and will be around for a long time. So is it really so surprising to think JC could be a pro bowler as a rookie? I mean, it's been over 60 years since an Eagles first year players accomplished that feat. But if anyone could do it, it's number 98. I'm not betting against him, but how about you guys? I mean, JC's without question the leader in the clubhouse when it comes to the defensive rookie of the year odds, especially given the fact that Carter has a 93.2 PFF grade through three weeks, ranking first among interior defenders as well as third among all defenders, leaving Adam Smith to say Jalen Carter is playing his third NFL game and he's already the most dominant defensive lineman in the history of the game. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Okay, that's a slight exaggeration, but the Breadman is clearly a difference maker. However, after the takeaway, there wasn't much time left, so the Eagles went with three from Elliott to make it 13-3 at half. And I'd say a very solid first half from the defense, yet there was a little to be desired on the offensive side of the ball. But at least Brian Johnson made some adjustments at halftime, as Jalen got going with the AJ connection again, as well as a healthy dose of handoffs to DeAndre Swift. And kudos to the O-line for making it just a bit easier on Swift. Like Hunter Brody said, the Eagles O-line is like playing on rookie mode in Madden. It's the most dominant thing I've ever seen in my entire life. The big guys deserve their credit for 259 yards rushing against the Vikings and then 201 yards rushing on Monday Night Football. However, the most impressive play of the night came early in the third quarter where Swift took a handoff up the middle before deciding to jump clear over and hurdle Buck safety Antoine Winfield Jr. I mean, it's no wonder this dude's second in the league in rushing despite only getting one carry in week one, which is crazy to even think about. But curious, do you guys think the 24-year-old can keep up this level of play? I think he can, especially with the vision and patience he's shown, which got the team all the way down to the one before A.J. Brown dropped a catchable ball for a touchdown, albeit it was a little bit high, but he should have caught it. Although it was surprising B.J. didn't call the QB sneak immediately, but he eventually went with it since it's unstoppable and everything, putting the birds up 17. And once again, Tampa couldn't get anything going, and I wouldn't expect many teams to fare better with the way the pocket was collapsing all night. But sound the alarms, we have a Nolan Smith sighting, where he absolutely lit up Baker Mayfield. And if you know anything about this channel, you know I was absolutely hyped to see Nolan Smith deliver a shot to Baker Mayfield. This was where momentum seemed to be building with the offense going through Swift for another huge gain of 29 yards. Although Jalen tried to give Devontae Smith a chance to make a play on the ball in the next play, might have been slightly underthrown, but Jalen had a little pressure as he threw. And honestly, a great play by D. Delaney to come away with the takeaway. Which, alright, I don't love two picks on the day, but it wasn't the worst thing considering the Bucks had to set up shop at their own one. As Brandon Graham was apparently talking smack before the play, guaranteeing a safe is coming before linebacker Nicholas Morrow took advantage of both Jalen Carter and Jordan Davis getting double teamed to squeeze through and make a great play to get the safety. By the way, it's also worth pointing out again just how strong and dominant Jordan Davis can be at the point of attack, clearly initially getting caught off balance before putting the hammer down and saying good night. So with the safety, the Eagles got the ball back and moved down the field where they were in position to score again, but got too cute in my opinion on a third and goal from the two, causing Jake Elliott to have to come in for yet another field goal. By that time, the game felt just about out of reach, but you knew you couldn't keep Mike Evans down the entire game, which of course he made some spectacular catches to keep a drive alive before hauling in the touchdown grab from Mayfield. And sure, would it have been nice to keep them out of the end zone? Absolutely. However, the big win I love to see is the Eagles got the ball back with 922 remaining after that bug score and presumed to go 68 yards on 15 plays to run out the clock, not even giving the ball back to Tampa, which has got to be one of the most demoralizing ways to lose a football game, especially with the atmosphere feeling like a home game and Sirianni showing some love after the game to the crowd. Out. Of course, I know there were some comments about why did Swift not get a carry in the fourth quarter, but I think it was smart to keep him fresh and healthy, although he would have been perfectly fine going back out there. Uh, I'm not sure. My, my number just wasn't called. Um, I was ready. Um, if it was to be called, though. All right, honestly, I don't think it's that big of a deal because remember, like Jalen says, uh, I've seen him say to, to the my time is done. Um, keep the main thing the main thing move forward and continue to grow and soak up as much as I can I think all of us would agree There's more that you need to see from this offense yet There is still time so I think we can relax and say there was at least a little progress coming away from week two to week three Plus Nick Sirianni reminded as he always does to not get carried away We're not gonna be playing our best football until we get going into the season. We still got things to, to work on We still got growth to do um, If you're truly in the mindset of getting better every day Right. If you're truly in that mindset of getting better every day, which I know I know that we are it, it, on this team, you're going to continue to rise and you're not and you, you're going to keep getting better. And so, 
you know, are we playing our best offensive football right now? No, but we shouldn't be. We, we shouldn't be yet, and, and it's a growth. And, and so, and, and all the teams are growing. No one's playing the best football that they, they should be playing right now, uh, you know? And so, um, you know, I've been pleased with where we are. Okay, I want to hear from you guys, though. Final takeaways from week three. Any major concerns, and what were the biggest positives? I think one of my favorite summarizations of Monday is like what David Hellman said, the Eagles still aren't clicking, and they rolled up 472 yards of offense, held Tampa to 174, won by 14 on the road, and stole the Bucks' souls by keeping the ball for the last 930 of the game. Terrifying that this felt like it wasn't their best effort. Or, I guess, terrifying for everyone else, but I'm optimistic after what we just saw. Also appreciate all the support and had a blast on the live stream during the game as we gave away the hoodie. And if you missed out, don't worry, we'll have plenty more throughout the season. The good news is we're 3-0, and that's all that matters. This has been the Philly Special.